Welcome, welcome. Uh, doing a short teaching, continuing our series on salvation, soteriology, I want to do a teaching on the cross and the passion of the Christ and why that cross was necessary. Why did God choose the method that he chose for Christ to die. And I think this is important as we uh, review salvation, as we study salvation. Uh, this is going to be important for us. So I'll just give just a second to let the different uh, links go out. All right. Thank you to everyone who joins, uh, who is going to watch this. Why was the cross necessary? Why was the cross necessary? The passion of the Christ. When we hear this word passion, um, the basis of everything, the accomplishments, the benefits of the death of cross is of the death of Christ is his death on the cross. That is the foundation. That is the theological uh, ground that we plant our flag in. And so when we look at this, we, we see that passion means suffering. And we're especially looking at the sufferings of Christ between the night of the Last Supper and the crucifixion. That is what we are looking at when we talk about passion, the sufferings of Christ, the sufferings of Christ. So let's look first at the need for his passion. Why was this needed? You see, when we, when we if you remember, we looked at uh, Reformed theology and Calvinism and the, the biblical doctrine of total depravity. Sa salvation, Christ, his sufferings were needed because man was sinful. Man was helpless. Total depravity teaches that when Adam sinned in the garden, when he failed, the theological term, the fall in Genesis 3, every aspect of our being was corrupted. It was infected. It was sick. Your, your your willpower, your mind, your emotions, creation, everything was affected by sin. But now man is infected. There is nothing we can do in our fallen state to invoke salvation. We are sinful. The Bible is full of this. All of these scriptures teach us that man is sinful. Man is sinful. We're helpless. We are dead in our trespasses and our sins. Someone had to step in 
and aid us. Someone had to step in and revive us. Regeneration, vivification, bringing us to life. Born again is the biblical is the, the old church saying. Why? Because we were separated from God. Sin brought, sin brings estrangement from God. And depravity means that nothing you do will ever merit any favor or consideration from God as far as salvation is concerned. Everyone is born a sinner. I don't care what the world tells you, what the the false teachers on the, the internet and the media tell you. No one is good. There's no such thing as a good person. There is no such thing as a good heart. Everyone is born a sinner. Everyone is condemned because of your relationship to Adam's sin. In Romans chapter 5, you are condemned because of your sin nature. Ephesians chapter 2, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are children of disobedience. Our, Our entire being is bent towards following the sinful pleasures and cravings. And everyone commits sin. Everyone commits sin. Romans 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, radical corruption, total depravity, There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. No one. So that's why it was necessary for Christ to die in the fashion that he died. That is why the cross was necessary. Everyone born into this world is helpless to do anything, to gain any kind of favor with God. Depravity means Depravity means that because your entire being has been corrupted, there is nothing you can do without God. In relationship to your salvation, total depravity means that help has to come from someone who has not been affected with that corruption that you have been corrupted with. Plain English. Jesus never sinned. We sin. We have a sin nature. Therefore, he is the only one who is qualified to atone for our sins. Let's look at the person of the passion. The person of the passion. Jesus was the God-man. This is the hypostatic union. Christ in his one person his had two natures. Only this type of being could have affected our salvation. You see, the incarnation, that is the in 
fleshing, the putting on of flesh, becoming man. The incarnation was necessary because Christ was to save his people from their sins. It was necessary because God has declared that the penalty of sin was to be death. Since God cannot die, there had to be an incarnation in order that there be a human nature that experienced death and thus paid the penalty for sin. And thus paid the penalty for sin. You see, the God ordained means of accomplishing the incarnation was now the virgin birth. Why the virgin birth? Matthew 1.16, in the Greek, there is a feminine, a feminine singular pronoun, by whom, your English translation will say by whom, links Christ to his one human parent being Mary. Christ came through Mary. He did not inherit the sin nature through Joseph. So the result of the virgin birth, therefore, is a theoanthropos, a God man. God always was. Bad English, good theology. The total human nature was conceived by the spirit in the womb of Mary. And the baby born was fully God and a perfect human being united in one person forever. That two natures is what we call in theology the hypostatic union. So this God-man is unique. He's unique in all of history. He alone qualifies to be an adequate Savior. Christ alone is the adequate Savior. He is the Savior of the world. The Savior had to be human in order to be able to die. God does not die. The Savior had to be God in order to make that death effective payment for sin. A sinless person can atone for the sins of others. That is the Theoanthropos, the God-man. Romans 1, the first, Romans chapter 1, the first four verses, great theological nutshell capsule of the gospel. You see, the gospel concerns God's son, and that son was human coming from the seed of David, and he was divine, designed, designated to be the son of God. There we have the hypostatic union of Christ. In other words, we have a gospel simply because, hallelujah, we have a God man, a savior man who as man is able to die and as God can make that death a satisfactory payment for the sins of the world. No other kind of Savior can save.
And so Christ suffered in his passion. So the sufferings, his passive obedience, he willingly submitted himself to man to be whipped and beaten. He he suffered and he learns obedience. And so therefore, only the sufferings on the cross were atoning. It was during the three hours of darkness when God laid on to Christ the sins of the world that atonement was being made. How how was this suffering carried out? It was carried out through the method of crucifixion. You see, the Persians invented and practiced crucifixions. The Romans take it and they perfect it. And basically, crucifixion was death by suffocation. Death by suffocation. John 19, 1, Christ was flogged. And what flogging consisted of is you, you strip the person naked and they are tied to a stump and they are beaten 39 lashes he was given with the cat of nine tails and that was leather with metal glass metal shards in it glass bone anything and it ripped across and would pull the flesh from the body of the victim After 39 lashes, Christ was then required to shoulder that crossbeam of the cross, carrying it up to Golgotha's hill, the place of the execution. And the beam weighs anywhere from 30 to 100 pounds. He is exhausted, having been up all night, bounced around from trial and courtroom to courtroom, nails seven inch long, driven into his hands and into his feet. a crown of 72 thorns wrapped and beaten into his head until his head uh, swelled three times the normal size. Death rarely came in less than 36 hours. Most victims died two or three days later until they they would break the bones to kind of speed up the process. Because every time the victim would try to gasp for air, they're pushing up on the the, the 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 nails in the feet and the raw back is getting scraped back up against the, the wooden cross and these wounds are being reopened. This is what Christ went through. This was the chosen and agreed upon method for your salvation. Christ went through all of that for us. And so this is just a brief teaching, a brief looking at salvation uh, deeper, you know, at a a level of appreciation. We can appreciate what Christ went through. Never take for granted what he went through on the cross. And so we're, we're, we're delving into salvation, so teriology. We're looking at the cross now. And then next we're going to look at um, the benefits that are given to us from the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. So until the next video, until we meet again, God bless you. God keep you. And remember, question everything. Ask people, show me in the book. God bless you.